So we'll get to see Zerg production, Protoss production, and Terran production. And then we'll open it up to Q&A at the end. So, welcome. Welcome, it's really exciting to get to share a lot of this information with you. Many of us play StarCraft all the time, and as you get this kind of knowledge of how the game works, you really want to share it so other people have some direction in their own play and they can enjoy the game. And as a streamer and a grandmaster, I get a bunch of really good questions from people. One of the questions is usually in this kind of format. They'll say, Neuro, I'm losing to Biotank. There are Biotank timings and I'm dying. Do you know what I should do? And I'll say, well, well, my dear friend, StarCraft is not precisely a rock, paper, scissors game. It is not simply that a match is decided based upon, well, did you bring scissors to the battlefield? Because, oh, unfortunately, the opponent brought rock, so, yeah, you lost. No. In StarCraft, we have numbers. We have math. We have the ability to create more stuff than the opponent. And it's not always straightforward of how to make that process happen. How do I build more stuff? How do I hit 200 supply faster? Well, if you're asking those questions, you're in luck because today we are learning. We're learning about StarCraft. We're learning one of the fundamentals, which is how do I build more stuff? If I can quote The Art of Learning, he said, it is rarely a mysterious technique which drives us to the top, but rather a profound mastery of what may well be a basic skill set. So, one of the basic skills in StarCraft is building more stuff. So let's do it. Let's figure out how we can build more stuff than our opponent and get an advantage in production. Number one. So we're looking at bringing that fighting force, right? Because battles are complicated. There's a lot of stuff going on, and it's sometimes tough to figure out what your edge is. And I would say the most obvious edge for war historically, and battlefields that have passed, is who brought more dudes? Who brought more stuff to the fight? Because whoever has more stuff is going to have a clear advantage. And in StarCraft, a lot of times someone just gets so far ahead that micro doesn't even matter. We watch the top level players, we watch GSO Codes, and when you're watching Codes, it's like, wow, look at Innovations in Micro, look at Rogue doing those burrowed Baneling bombs. It's so fancy, it's so cool. But for the rest of us, people who are trying to figure out how this game works, it is very rare that a fancy Micro move wins us the game. It is more common that the person who builds more stuff wins the game. And that usually is decided before the fight happens. So this is a StarCraft fundamental skill, production. The most robust edge players can create for themselves is building more stuff. So I broke it down into some elements. We've got economy, infrastructure, technology, and army. Some people have talked about StarCraft in terms of just the three, of how to get an advantage in terms of economy, technology, and army where infrastructure is kind of a task that is assumed to be done correctly. But I don't know about you, StarCraft is not perfectly intuitive. I don't just load up the game and it's like, oh yeah, I mean, I placed into bronze, but it's pretty easy. And I just, you know, did a couple ladder games and now I'm GM. No, it was hard. I started in bronze and it's been multiple years of study and deliberate practice to move up and basically paring down the mistakes that you're making and letting flourish the good moves that you're making. So this will be kind of broken into pieces so it's more digestible for you. We've got economy as the first one. So in StarCraft we have resource management. It is not just a battle simulator where you have an army and an army and you just try to fight each other. You have to get resources. You have to make money so that you can build stuff so this kind of quotes a lot of what I was just saying about Fancy Micro is what we see and we kind of remember with a lot of these top tier games, but prioritizing the collection of resources, 
I would say is one of the least punishable moves in StarCraft. So I came to StarCraft from poker, and the book that I studied for poker talked a lot about playing solid. Playing solid means that you play in a way that is not exploitable by your opponent. In StarCraft, we can think about the game in the same way. How can I power up and make a move that my opponent can't see and then exploit? I think probably the best move in StarCraft that you can make that they can't just capitalize on is building another worker. What are they going to do? If you have, say, 25 workers and you build a 26th worker, they can't say, aha, now I'm going to go get you and win the game. No, with Defender's Advantage, the time that it takes for them to walk across the map, you'll be able to make stuff and defend and be fine. So getting a worker advantage is a really important thing. And we'll look at infrastructure management throughout this class. But in the business capacity, if you have a building, if you have a facility with employees inside of it, you want them to be productive. You want them to produce something. So we all start with one town hall structure. We have a hatchery, or we have a nexus, or we have a command center. So we should use it, unless we have a specific timing or a specific cheese we're trying to hit. If we want to go from early to mid to late game, we should use our facilities. So constantly produce workers toward your saturation goal. I listed out some saturation goals here so you have some clear numbers to work with. One base saturation or less, that's if you're doing a really early cheese. You've got stuff like proxy barracks, you've got Ling Bane busts with one base, you've got proxy gateway zealots, you've got the cannon robo stuff for Protoss. There are quite a few one base builds in StarCraft, but a lot of times you still expand off the back of it and get into a macro game. So you should be prepared to transition off the back of what you're doing and not just have a plan A, but also have a plan B for what you're working with. And then moving forward, we have the 25 to 35 workers for 1.5 base timings. This I think is important because it usually involves the first little clash between players. We moved from a six worker start in Wings and Heart of the Swarm to a 12 worker start in Legacy of the Void. And the first time that players usually kind of butt heads and have a little battle is right around this period. So 25 to 35, the first little harassment pieces are kind of coming together. And at around four to five minutes in the game, someone tries to attack someone, an Oracle flies in, there's a Ling Bane attack, there's a Hellion drive-by. That's when the kind of standard macro moments tend to happen. So once you have your two bases, you want to get to around 35 to 44 and take your third. We'll look at the timings for when to be taking your expansions and stuff, but these are just some really good benchmarks. Blizzard was very nice to add a feature in the game that doesn't hurt the highest level of skill at all, but if you mouse up in the top right hand corner of your screen to your supply, you can see your supply in army and in workers. And workers are one supply, so it tells you your worker count. That's a way that you can check your count and see, well, I have two bases. Do I actually have two base saturation? Because those are not the same thing. Someone who has two bases, you would think of that more as just two town hall structures. But having two bases saturated is a much different setup with a very different income than, say, just a Zerg who has two hatches. They injected both of them, but they only have one base of drones and they're sending a bunch of lings at you. That's a very different scenario from a Zerg who has 44 drones, all four of their gases, and a Spire on the way. So moving into the three base kind of situation, you've got 50 to 67. 50 workers on three bases would be something like maybe two to three gases, and then the rest of mineral saturation. And 67 is when you have all three bases 16 out of 16, and then all of your gases are filled. And then the final point would be 70 to 80. I would say 70 is a good one to shoot for. If you're learning the game and you're not already like a master's player, going beyond 70 I think has 
pretty big diminishing returns because it gets harder to spend your income as you get more than 70 workers. 70 is pretty good. And then the point B here in procedure is that you want to saturate your base for minerals before you saturate it with gas. I'm going to explain why that's important. The reason that you take your mineral saturation before your gas saturation is because most of your infrastructure costs cost minerals, not gas. Gas is nice, but in order to invest in the stuff that unlocks your gas, you need a bunch of minerals. A couple examples. Extractors cost minerals, and they consume drones, which cost minerals. Assimilators cost minerals. Pylons and gateways cost minerals. So if you're powering up and you're trying to take a base, which costs minerals, you need minerals before you need gas. If you're kind of saturating your bases, it's usually better to spike up a little bit above 16 workers than it is to have a base that's kind of humming along at 12 to 14. If you don't have your base fully saturated, it's like having a location and not getting the full value from that. Because in StarCraft, you're trying to defend yourself against your opponent, who's trying to kind of attack and harass you and stuff. And if you have an intact base, you might as well get the full value from defending that location. Good job defending it. Now, get your value. Get your value from there, okay? So let's look at the infrastructure required for these economy sizes that we're talking about. So the bank management of your income and stuff is pretty difficult to figure out. You have the two things you're trying to balance, right? Between you want to be able to spend your money, you don't want to float a bunch of money, but you also don't want too much production where you just have a bunch of idle facilities that you can't actively use. So it's trying to find that happy medium between having too much production and too little, just the right amount of production. So we're gonna look at this for all three races. Off a 25 drone economy, you wanna have one to two injected hatcheries. The thing for Zerg, let's talk about a, a Zerg principle for your production. You wanna be aware of the larva efficiency of the unit that you're making. Well, what is larva efficiency? The larva efficiency is the amount of resource that is put into each larva. So an example, two zerglings is 50 minerals, and that's one larva. The zergling is the least larva efficient unit that zerg has. So if your plan involves a lot of zerglings, you're going to need a lot of larva for your economy size, right? What's one on the opposite end of the spectrum? The ultralisk. The ultralisk is 300 minerals, 200 gas, that's 500 resource in a single larva, which is huge. So that kind of incentivizes moving along to hive tech. If the game is progressing, one of the advantages of making hive tech stuff is you become more larva efficient by making units like ultras, broodlords, vipers, that kind of thing. So be aware of the larva efficiency of your unit. There is one exception as well, which is the queen. The queen does not involve larva. The queen comes directly from the hatchery. So that's a really good unit to be aware of that you can use to extend your production, especially if you don't have the larva that you need to spend your income. Queens are really good investments. They're pretty versatile on your side of the map. They can defend harassment. They can spread creep. They can inject your bases. They can do a lot of stuff. They have a lot of HP. So don't be afraid to make queens if your money is spiking up. Maybe you missed an inject. Maybe something happened. It's fine. Make some queens. So we're moving along to the 30 to 55. You want three injected hatcheries. 60 to 70, you want three injected hatches and a macro hatch. This can vary some, like I was saying with the, the Ling Bane. If you have a Ling Bane oriented composition, you're gonna need maybe a little bit more larva than you would if you were playing Roach Hydra. If you're playing Roach Hydra, as we said before, it's more larva efficient, so you don't need quite as many bases injected to be able to spend your bank. And then deciding between these, we'll look at near the end of the class, we'll look at compositions and whatnot. 
but the style you go for, I think is something that you can choose for yourself. So you don't need to say, oh, well, everyone should play Roach Hydra or everyone should play Ling Bane Muta. You should play what you feel is cool and fun and exciting because there are a lot of viable ways to approach your macro and improvement in StarCraft. Thank you, Scarlet, for the host. We're in the middle of a class on production. Welcome. Welcome. So we're talking about infrastructure now. So the amount of production facilities you need for a given economy size so that people can spend their bank appropriately and, like we said, build more stuff and bring more to the field of battle. So welcome. Let's, let's dive back into this. So Protoss, you've got your 25 probe magic here, which could be four gate or three gates with one robo and stargate. It could be one base DT, but that's around 20 to 25 probes, give or take. And what else do you have? 30 to 55, six to eight gateways with one or two robo and stargate. We'll look at some replay examples of this and we'll look at the times that these happen once we've covered the notes. So 60 to 70, you can see kind of the rest of them, 70 to 80. I got a lot of these numbers from some of the opponents I played against in GM. I think Disc is the Protoss that we're gonna look at in the replay. He almost always beats me in a macro game. He's really good at transitioning from one stage to another, being active with his units, but then also having a follow-up where he's not just hoping that his timing works, he knows the next step. He's taken the next base, He's moving into the next stage of technology. So for Terran, we've got your decision here between bio and mech. Now, I know a lot of people, they'll say, oh, bio is the best. And then some people will say, oh, mech is the best. It's a pineapple on pizza thing. You do what you want to do, okay? You don't need someone to tell you that it's the best to play mech or the best to play bio. If you're a Terran player, then you play Terran how you want to play Terran, okay? So the principle though still applies of you want your production to match your income, regardless of whether you're gonna play mech focused or bio focused or kind of a hybrid between the two, right? Because you could have maybe a little bit extra factories and a little bit less barracks, but maybe you're kind of leaning between one or the other. It doesn't matter, you do what you want. So you've got 25 SCV, which is the one base, the two base, the three base and the four base. There's a notes command, and you can get these notes in the description of the VOD, so I don't need to read off everything to you, and we'll see some examples here in a little bit. So, waboom. Let's look at technology. This is something that I notice a lot when I'm coaching people, and that is sometimes a player's technology doesn't progress, and it's not because they are going for a big timing, Sometimes they just forget that that's something that needs to be prioritized. Technology and the improvement of technology is super important. It's super important for diversifying and enhancing the effectiveness of your army. So this is kind of a different type of more. So you see the tagline, bring more fighting force to the field of battle. Having an upgrade gives more force to each of your units that show up at the battle. So you want a continuous progression, which means you invest in some kind of tech, and as that's finishing, you invest in another kind of tech. And then as that's finishing, you get another one, and then another one. So we have some examples here. This is just kind of one track for each of the three races. If you're Zerg, maybe you start with your Ling Speed, and then as that's finishing up, you drop your Evo Chamber, and you're getting plus one missile in a lair. Oh, that's great and then you get Roach Speed whenever your lair is done. And then you get Burrow and Tunneling Claws and plus two whenever those are done. <clears throat> so that as the game is progressing, you're getting more dangerous in more ways to your opponent, as opposed to having a more simple composition. So for Terran, we've got a Barracks Factory Reactor, which could be Hellions or Cyclones, Starport Tech Lab Armory and Cloak. So a Hellion Banshee opening or a Hellbat Banshee opening is a really solid way to open up where you can defend stuff if you're attacked and you can present threats on the opponent's side of the map. 
The Banshees can kill workers. The Hellions can drive by. The Hecbaths can just sometimes drive over the opponent and beat them. It depends, but you want to have some plan that involves as soon as one step finishes, the next step begins. For Protoss, you've got your gateway going down. When your gateway is done, you want your cyber core going down. When your cyber core is done, you want to get warp gate research and maybe a twilight council. And then maybe you get a dark shrine, whatever you want. You can do the style how you want to, but the principle of moving your technology along remains the same. Makes sense. So I know I'm just kind of going through the notes right now. We'll have Q&A at the end after we go over some of the games and stuff. So this is kind of the big and fun one where we get to decide on the type of army that we're going to build. So I said this at the beginning, most battles are decided before the fight actually begins, especially below the pro level, just based on who represented more stuff at the field. So one thing that people will ask is they'll say, Neuro, and I'll be like, yes, what do I do against Charge Lot Archon Immortal? Or what do I do against Bio Tank? How do I play against Roach Hydra? These are just solid, well-rounded compositions. So if you're losing to a solid, well-rounded composition, that means that you're not representing a solid, well-rounded composition of equal or greater value. Because if you had even an army of the same size, with defender's advantage, you should be winning those fights. Because your reinforcements are coming out sooner to help you with the battle. So that tells me that you fell behind at some point. Because, let's be real for a second, the game is mostly balanced. It's, it's a very fair contest, a StarCraft match. And if you lost, the important thing to find out is, where did I make some mistakes leading up to the fight? And if you can identify that, and then say, okay, I got supply blocked at 32, maybe I fell behind in upgrades, maybe my composition wasn't very good, the units that I was making didn't have good synergy, then you can review and you can improve moving forward. So let's look at some examples and then we can think about some that we could make up from this. We've got, for Zerg, you've got Ling Bane Yuta, one of the classic compositions. It's very fast, it's fun to play. I would rate this as a more difficult unit composition because Ling Bane Yuta tends to be the most successful if the Ling Bane has one kind of control group and they have their own job. And then the Mutas are off on a different quest where they go and they harass the opponent. They're looking to pick off drops. They're doing different things than the Ling Bane a lot of the time, which I would rate as harder to manage both of those by attention. But it's very good. You've seen Scarlet do Ling Bane Muta a whole bunch, and she's done it really well in periods where people are saying, oh no, it's, it's not viable. It's all about Ling Bane Hydra now. It's always been viable. It's just hard to play. But it scales really well into Ultraling Bane and Fester Corruptor. Just a nice, big, tradable, tough composition. You can knock down bases. You can fight the enemy's army. Oftentimes, you can kind of charge up and get on top of their production and win the game. And then, like I mentioned, Link Bane Hydra is quite good. I think that's probably the easiest one, maybe to play against Terran and survive moving forward. The reason it's a little bit easier is the Hydras get to stay with the Ling Bane, and they kind of all work together. There's a nice synergy of range here, which is a really important point for figuring out your composition. You don't want units that have the same range as each other, because they kind of trip over each other, and they can't succeed at their role. So if you have, say, a bunch of Ling Bane, and you have Hydras behind it, the Hydras have six range if you upgraded them, so they can sit very comfortably in the back, just shooting at some stuff. And then the Ling Bane is rushing up in front with melee range, and they absorb a bunch of the damage for the Hydras, which are more expensive and more fragile. So there's a natural synergy there. What about Ultras and Corruptors? Ultras only attack ground, but they're very good at it. Corruptors only attack air, and they don't have the unit collision, like Ultras and Hydras do. Sometimes I struggle with the Ultra transition with a Hydra style because 
Ultras and Hydras are around the same movement speed, so sometimes you'll get situations where your Ultras are stuck behind your Hydras, and you get a little bit of that uh, kind of traffic jam situation for your units. So be aware of that, and take your time when you're going to set up your engagements. So Roach Hydra Viper, Roach Hydra, you've got the Roaches, they tank in the front, the Hydras, they DPS in the back, the Vipers, they support on top, that's awesome. And then you can do a Broodlord transition. I think that path is really good for people starting out if you're Zerg, because it doesn't require as much micro, and it's not as, you could say, fragile and volatile as a Lane Bane composition. Lane Bane, sometimes you get blown up by mines and people get very upset. So Roach Hydra, it's a bit more sturdy and robust if you prefer that. Lane Bane is faster and can be pretty exciting sometimes, so you want to find what works for you. There is a, a key point here about the way that your composition is going to be successful. This is something that comes up for me as a Zerg streamer a lot with Hydraling Bane versus Protoss versus Hydra Lurker. Because I play Hydraling Bane against Protoss, Leenok plays that way as well, and that style is not the best at just running in and fighting the Protoss army. That's more of a, the Ling Bane kind of has the muta job in the previous example, where the Ling Bane is backstabbing the Protoss. It's rushing in, busting a base, and fighting probes, whereas the Hydras are on creep, keeping you safe from big attacks. So that is a composition that you can try if you want to, but know that it's not going to be as successful at doing the big direct fights as something like 14 Lurkers. If you have tons of Lurkers, you do really well fighting big armies, and they have to represent a ton of fighting force to beat Lurkers. So you want to find the composition here that is not only solid and has synergy with itself, but one that you enjoy to play and kind of fits how you want to approach your matchups. Be like water and drink water. Sweet. <clears throat> so let's look at some Terran ones. I mentioned Marine Medivac, Marine Tank Medivac, classic, awesome. The Marine shoot stuff, the Medivacs heal stuff, the tanks shoot stuff. The tank is the loudest unit in the game, that's awesome. And you can go for Liberators and Ghosts, wonderful. Hellbat Banshee, Tank Viking. You've got Mech, you've got Bio, you've got Hellbat Cyclone styles, which are really cool to play. You've got Marine Marauder Medivac. Just so you know, if you haven't been checking the patch notes, Marauders are buffed, Marauders are back, Marauders are good. Be careful. <laughs> I've died to them a few times when I'm trying to make my Ultras. Marauders only fire once at a time now, which means they're not quite as countered by armor upgrades. They used to shoot twice, which meant that the person with the armor upgrade gets two instances of value from it, so two points of reduction, as opposed to only one. So lots of cool options for Terran there. You also have some other stuff like our our friend Nathanius. He's a battle cruiser man, right? So he doesn't need to necessarily follow the two one one into the marine tank timing and whatever. He goes battle cruisers and Thors, and he does what he likes, and he can get up to a high MMR with that. So you don't need to be too restricted by these lists. You can also just innovate your own. You say, I want to make tempests. Well, you go and you make Tempests, okay? Protoss, you've got Adept Oracle. Adepts and Oracles have great synergy with each other. They're both really fast. They can kind of hit some cool harassment timings. Phoenix DT, like Rotterdam, he loves that. It's really awesome. The Phoenixes clear the skies and the ninjas just clean the house. So you've got Carrier, High Templar, Archon, Immortal. That's just a really awesome late game Protoss composition. And when I mention this one, I want to make a point here because this is something that people get all of Russell about. They'll say, what are you supposed to do against that? It's just too strong. It's too strong. StarCraft is a game, and we forget about this, that is asymmetrically balanced. What does that mean? Asymmetrically balanced means that 
the races are balanced overall, but they're not balanced in a way that makes them all strong in the same ways. So to describe it real quick, Zerg tends to have the cheaper units that are built more quickly and that are faster, but they're not as good on average. Protoss has the big units that are really expensive. They take a long time to build, but they're powerful. They're really powerful. So if the players are getting a 200 supply, you would expect for even skill for maybe a Zerg to hit 200 supply first, if the game is perfectly even, and then Terran and Protoss a little bit after that, but at 200 supply, Protoss can have some really awesome compositions. So you want to look at representing your supply advantage whenever you can. Say you have 170 supply. 170 supply is a really good time to represent your army because that allows you to remax into something that's higher quality than before. So some other Protoss compositions, Zealot Stalker Sentry, classic stuff, Immortal Sentry Stalker, and then Giraffes, Colossus Stalker Sentry Tempest. You've got Zealot Void Ray, you've got Carrier stuff, High Templar, great synergy between High Templar and Sky Toss. And then for the fourth one, we give a nod to Printf and kind of this new wave of cannon contains with the shield battery and the robo. It's pretty interesting. Interesting stuff. It's very viable, even at GM level. And if you're facing or if you're executing this one base robo kind of stuff, you kind of need a different sort of game plan. I won't get into that in great detail today, but... That is one of the scenarios that I think involves more of a micro-oriented game rather than one that has a bunch of bases where you have camera management and that kind of thing. So it's, it's just a different kind of refreshing way to have your StarCraft matches play out. Okay. <clears throat> was that the fifth one? Yeah, it was. Sweet. So now we can get into some real game examples here. I've got some real awesome games with real awesome players. What do you want to do first? Maybe we can do ZBT. That is the one that people ask for tips on the most. <clears throat> this is against Future. Future is a an awesome young Terran from NA. He's been improving real fast. He actually qualified for Challenger for WCS. So we're going to be looking at both players here and what their production looks like. What does their production look like? How are they spending their money in this game? So the match is starting off. Remember we were talking about that, like 25 or so workers that we're both building up. He's getting his orbital. Notice that all of his stuff is working. Every single unit that he owns, every single facility that he owns is just working away because this is a war. This is a, a really intense contest. StarCraft is not chess. It is not a game where, all right, you get to take a turn, and then I'll take a turn. This is a game where both players are taking as many turns as they possibly can. And that is production, right? So he's going for Double Barracks Factory. So look at this here. Remember how I said 25 workers? The first little piece of action is happening. This is the one that he's chosen, which is Double Medivac Marine. Isn't that awesome? He's mewling away. Terran does have mules that supplements their mineral income. They can also repair stuff. I have my hatches here on my side of the map. Look at this. I've got some bases. I've got some bases. Awesome. I took a fast third, and I spread some creep. Now some people might say, uh-oh. <clears throat> uh-oh, Nero. Look at your money. You have 324. This is part of my build, because when I have 450, that is just the amount to make three queens. So look at that. My money is spent again. Wonderful. So this is kind of the first stage. We got to see how many buildings. This is two barracks, a factory, and a starport, kind of in the one to two base stage. And we don't need to focus super hard on all the action of this game. We're mainly looking at the infrastructure and what the layout of these bases look like as the economy is developing. So look at Future. He's attacking with some medivacs. 
I'm defending with some wings and some queens. But what are we still doing? What are we still doing during all of this this awesome action of medivacs going in, running around, queens and links? We're still macroing. Look at the production tab. He's got a supply depot. He's got a base. He's got three marines coming out of his barracks. He's got 1-1 one, one upgrades going. And he has combat shield. So as you're being active with your units, you should know what your infrastructure is doing at home. And a great way to manage that is with control groups. Look down here at the command card here. No, this is the command card. Look down here at the control groups. He has his army. He has a worker SCV. He has his medivacs, his orbitals, his barracks, his factory, and his starport. Why are these important to have on a hotkey? These ones, four through seven. The reason for that is that allows him to activate his infrastructure without looking at it. He doesn't need to go from his army that's working hard to clear creep and harass and then go all the way back home and then look at his buildings and say, okay, you do this, you do this, you do this, you do this. He can just keep looking at this and then press four and he could make workers. He could press five and then hit his marine button and then he could press six and he could do whatever he wants without even looking at his infrastructure. So I highly recommend making sure that your production is on a hotkey. It's a really nice way to streamline the management of that kind of stuff. So here I'm taking a macro hatch. My bases are injected. These kind of games are pretty intense too. You've got lots of action going on in the CVT. So you'll see some mistakes for me here. Because sometimes my base is not injected. I don't always have a good reason for that. Rather than just, the game is going real fast and I'm not doing everything perfectly. So that's okay. Everyone who plays this game plays it imperfectly. Just do your best. You can analyze it after the fact. So now I'm trying to take my fourth. I want to give you one important tip with StarCraft II Legacy of the Void. And we're looking right here and right here at the game clock. Eight minutes in, around eight minutes, your main base starts mining out. The main is mining. So you want to be getting that fourth base, even if you're not going for more workers. So sometimes people will say, ah, I'm not sure if I should take a fourth base. The fourth base is important to even maintain a three base economy. It's really important. So get that fourth base up before eight minutes, especially if you're Zerg, but I think for all three races, you can work on that fourth base real quick, quicker than you think, much quicker than you think. And don't be scared about taking a base. In Legacy, they buffed town hall structures they reward players with more supply now. So a hatchery used to be two, now it's six. Command centers are what, like 12 or 14? They give a ton of supply. And a nexus gives a ton of supply too. So he's harassing. He's trying to limit my production, to limit my growth, and kill this base. Medivacs go in, you can't explain that. And he's creating an advantage here by directing the flow on my side of the map while I'm not really harassing him on his side. But now look at his production. This is kind of the whole point. His three base economy is coming up and he has more barracks now. Look at this. Look at the structures tab. Now he has five barracks, one factory, one starport. He only had two barracks before. So he added these on when this base was coming up. So your production level, your infrastructure, should be developing as your income is developing because you want to be able to spend your income. Look at his spending. He's doing an awesome job. Awesome job, dude. 2-2 two, two upgrades. Great way to spend your gas. One problem that I especially see from Terran is a big, huge gas float in the mid-game. And one thing that I see from super good Terrans who just crush me is that they have a plan for how to spend that. They'll make some more factories for some Thors or tanks. They'll make some more starports for some liberators. 
before they'll start their ghost production. There are quite a few options for all three of the races. And you can kind of look at your money and say, hmm, I have more gas than minerals. Maybe I should spend a unit that costs more gas than minerals to get on top of my bank. Or the opposite. Maybe I have more minerals, so I want to make more mineral units. That's kind of how it goes. So I have a Ling Bane based composition, so this macro hatch is pretty important for me to spend my money. And I have an issue here that is kind of specific to this match and the harassment that Future has been doing. So he delayed my fourth, and then he's been harassing my fourth, so I'm having a little bit of a problem with my minerals. And this isn't so much that I'm not spending my money correctly or something is messed up on that front. He's limiting the increase in my income for minerals, which is good job on him. He's controlling that growth. He's making lots of marines and mines and medivacs. He has them in a nice spot. He's still churning away more stuff. And then look at this. Right as he's taking a base, he's adding on three more barracks. Those steps should go together. Take a base, increase your production. He's producing more stuff. He's making marauders. He's making marines. This is awesome. My bases are injected. I'm going for a hive so I have more larva efficient units. Awesome. Marine mine marauder medivac. Versus lean bane hydra. There's a battle going on. Who cares? This is about production. Both players are doing a, a decent job of staying on top of their money. I still have that mineral problem that I mentioned before because he's been harassing my fourth base so much. And this is just the joy of ZVT, right? Where it's not about who has the more mysterious build, I think. A lot of times it just comes down to your ability to multitask, to macro and micro, to manage multiple groups. He is outplaying me this game. And look at this, more starports being added on, just in time for him to maybe take some gases here, or take some gases here. Notice he's emphasized minerals more than gas. So he's not floating gas like a lot of people will do in the mid game. That's awesome. He's being very efficient and he's spending the income that he's getting. He's going for 3-3, which spends his minerals and gas. He's gonna put some add-ons on these starports and take a base. So wonderful stuff. We basically got what we needed from this game in terms of seeing the production. This is kind of a a death for the swarm. He's got a nice contain on this fourth base. And I need this income to be able to keep up my stuff. So, so good job, future. Well played. And thank you for showing us here. Let's look at the, the full and total structure count for future. He's got three starports, eight barracks, what, four bases with a fifth on the way, and one factory. Cool. Thank you for this demonstration, future. Examples. Examples. Thank you for the host, Ryu Tycoon. Thank you. Cool. Let's look at a ZVP. A ZVP. Mention add ons? Uh, if you have a building, it should have an add on. I don't think I know enough about Terran to get into the the weeds in the forest of how add-ons work and which ones you should make for what style kind of depends on the composition that you want to go for so we've got disc this time he's going to show us some protoss i'm the zerg again just using some replays from my own ladder games so disc he's taken a gas notice he took that after he reached 16 in his main like we were saying before Minerals before gas. Saturate your minerals, take your gas. I saturated my minerals, and then I took a gas. I'm making queens to spend my money. Droning up. He's taking a gas. So here we have the opening scenario. Remember last time with the Terran, there were two barracks, a factory, and a starport. For disc here, we have 
three gateways and a stargate. So it's a similar number of buildings, right? Robo's coming up. He's reaching two base saturation and look at that once again. As he's reaching two base saturation, he takes a gas. Still emphasizing minerals before getting the gas. Cool. Making some units, he's being active. And he's taking a third base. Part of your ability to afford this third base is by virtue of saturating this base for minerals because a base is fairly expensive and it costs 100% minerals. So get your mineral saturation, get your base, the pylons, and then we'll probably see as this saturation finishes, another round of production. I have my three bases injected. That's my production. And I'll go for a fourth here shortly. Okay, so his third is getting saturated. And he has more structures. Four more gateways on the way. One, two, three, four. And Templar Archives. He's got a forge. He's got a twilight. He's taken his gases. And then, I would guess, in a few moments, we'll see a fourth base. Awesome. Awesome stuff, friend disc. <clears throat> making immortals, making storm. And this is what we were saying before, of just a solid, well-rounded composition. He is not really going for anything mysterious, and there's synergy here. The zealots charge in the front, and they absorb damage, and they spend minerals. The Archons and Immortals sit in the back and they blow everything up. And the Storm, with the High Templar, they bring a big bit of AoE to the table. Okay, so he's going for his base here. Excellent. Building some cannons, which also cost minerals. Really anchoring down this base. Here he is protecting his investment. That's a good call. That's a good call. On my side of things, I'm working on my Hive. Or I should be. Hive Inspire. There we go. My bases are all injected. Look at this production. 26 lings. My style involves a lot of ling bane, which is very larva intensive. So I need to make sure my stuff is injected. And if I float minerals on top of that, I can make more queens or take a base. Don't be afraid to take bases. Your opponent has to invest in fighting force and time to be able to kill your bases. So expand. If you have tons of money, take an expansion. It's not a super big deal to lose a base, especially if you have nothing else there. It's just a hatch. We can cancel it. We could lose it. It's not huge. What's more important is a base that's saturated with a bunch of infrastructure. That's the pretty dicey stuff. Cool. So now, Disc has his fourth base up. What does his production look like here? What structures does he have? Disc has nine gateways, well, ten gateways, two robotics, a stargate, and I think he has some more on the way. So yeah, his fourth base is getting saturated, and he built another round of production to meet that level of income. He has how many workers here? 69 workers, astounding, and a fifth base. And he's taken the assimilators and some pylons. That's some great stuff. Fleet beacon, more upgrades. Just really robust macro here from disc. I wanna point out the location of where he put these as well. So most of his expensive facilities are in his main base, which is the furthest away from direct ground attacks. I could attack this base directly by ground. I could attack this base. I could attack this base. It's kind of blocked by some rocks. But in order for me to get here, I either have to drop or nidus, or I would have to push through the base and then go up the ramp and into here. So this is a, a pretty important thing too, is you want to put your most precious infrastructure and tech in a defensible location most of the time. Well, cool. That was basically all the production that we're going to see from here. His production and infrastructure. This match plays out. I kind of go for a timing with Broodlords, and he uses a big Zealot warp in, and he kills one of my crucial bases, which kind of mortally wounds me. Yeah. 
Yep. Well, awesome. Awesome, awesome. So I think we can probably open it up for questions here in a minute. Thanks everyone for hanging out. It is awesome to share this information with you. Oh yes. So the the cadence of speech, there's the the question of how fast can you say words versus how fast should you say words if you want to be understood and you don't have to repeat yourself and people won't be confused. An example of this would be say a public speaker or a president, they're gonna to wanna to speak in a way that everyone gets every word that they're saying. And I tend to be pretty hyped up, like this is super hype. We got on the launcher, Scarlet hosted us. This is amazing, I'm thrilled to be sharing this with you. And in the first class, I was a little, ah, going a little bit fast. So I wanna make it nice and digestible for everyone, be very clear about what's going on here. Well, sweet. So let's, Let's do some questions. Give me one minute, and then we'll get back and do some Q&A. Does that sound fun? Does that sound fun? Thank you, everyone, for being here today. I appreciate you. Appreciate everyone who is attending this special class. This is class number two on production. The previous class is on scouting. You can go, you can go and use the class command and watch the scouting class. We'll have more classes. Are these fun? Do you enjoy classes? I enjoy classes. I think it's really nice to kind of package some information in a way that is very clear and people can just add that to their toolkit. Today's class is about what? What is it about? Do you know? I think it's about building more stuff. That's what I think. <clears throat> okay, I'm ready. Give me your questions. What are your questions? Who has a question? Neuro, is, is rock, paper, scissors balanced? What is your question? All right, when is it a good time to take a third base as Terran? When do I know you're safe from Zerglings doing run by or canceling your third? You build your third base in the wall at your natural. So it helps you wall off. And usually you want to be active with some units like a Liberator or a Drop or some Hellions to know where their army is. But if you want just a random time, five minutes. You recommend transitioning from Vipers to Hydras and Infestors and Mutas. Oh, because Roach Hydra is countered by mass tanks. So Viper allows you to deal with mass tanks. And Ling Bane stuff, usually you want to have some fungal, especially to assist your ultras. What is your view on oversaturation, 17 out of 16, versus sending workers between the main and the natural before the expansion finishes? You get really great value on your investment, even up to, say, 18 to 19 workers at your base. So I wouldn't really count that as a mistake. 
and sending workers you lose a little bit of immediate mining time right <clears throat> so I, I think neither of those is a very high impact decision but yeah don't don't be too worried I know the number turns red if you have 17 out of 16 but 18 and 19 is totally fine do you think this two base opener with Stargate as Protoss is good versus all compositions? Yes, I would say that's one of the most solid ways to open up. What is a question? A question is a person on a quest that has put words into a sentence that is to be delivered to someone with the hopes of receiving something in return. Is it worth dive and calculations? How many minerals? Is it worth it to do the calculations of exactly how much income you have and how much infrastructure you need? We have one of those. Was it this one? No, it was this one. Yeah. It's in the notes. There you go. You could look at the number of income if you want to. I feel like that's something that's kind of... Knowing the number could be fun. Or you could just know what you need to spend it. What is an efficient way to spread creep fast? Look at the minimap and see where it is so you can jump right to it and have your queens on a hotkey. How do I maintain a good macro cycle with Terran? Well, you wanna basically have the control groups and address all of them. So you have your orbitals are on one, your production is on one, your army is on one. Orbitals, production, army, orbital, production, army just so you can kind of see what they're doing. Yes, Amadis, what is your question? Yes, Amadis, what is your question? How do I add more buildings to the hotbar? You shift, hold shift, and then press the number for that group. As Zerg, can I really expand as quickly as everyone seems to say I can? Yes, you can. Well, I guess maybe not everyone. Maybe some people say you can go eight hatch before pool and be safe. For that person, I would say no, that is not safe at all. But I think for Zerg especially, they really get a power spike once they have around three bases injected. So getting that third base at around three minutes is a very important piece that should help a lot of new Zerg players move up really fast. Because a lot of people are kind of worried about taking an expansion because they think they're going to be attacked really soon. But you can defend most things with your third base at a pretty early time. You don't really need to be afraid of stuff. Do you think that putting Barrack Starport or buildings in general under one hotkey and using tab, you can do that. That is one viable approach. You can weigh a bunch of different setups and no one is necessarily the most correct in all ways. You've got to find something that makes sense to you, that works for you. So you can tab between stuff, or you can put each of them on a different hotkey. What is a good counter against Void Rays as Terran? Marines and Widow Mines. When should I be adding gases to Lingbane Hydra? Well, you take the gases at a base after saturating it for minerals, like we mentioned. Usually you want around five total for your Hydraling Bane production. That's about how gas hungry the composition is. And then whenever you start your hive, you want to take your final gas, and then you could take the gases at your fourth base whenever you're making old treasure, broodlord or something. When do I build drones in ZVZ? Well, that's kind of a golden question, right? Because Zerg is unique because all their production comes from the hatches and you have to choose whether you want to build workers or when you want to build army. There's plenty of content on that in my uh, YouTube channel. You could check that. Scout timing for Zerg. So if you're Zerg, it's really good to fly an Overlord in at around 3.30 to 4 minutes against both Protoss and Terran. In ZVZ, you can send some speedlings to run around in their base and see what's up, and you can overseer scout when your lair is done. A reasonable time for your lair is probably around four to five minutes, depending on what your early game style is like. 
use the class command for the other class thingies. Why is all this focused so much on Terran and Toss? Ain't this a Zerg focused stream? We could we could dive into a ZVZ here. I have one prepared that can demonstrate the larva advantages that Zerg can secure for Jagged One. Let's do this. Let's take a look at larva. Because we looked a lot at Protoss and Terran. I wanted to make sure I was even-handed. I'm Zerg, so I have that Zerg bias. I'm the best with Zerg. And I understand Zerg the best, so I wanted to make sure for the Protoss and Terrans who are watching that they had some stuff to learn from. Zerg is a little bit more simple in one way, which is that all of their production comes from the hatchery itself. But it's a little bit more complicated, like with the question we just read in the chat, <clears throat> in that you have to choose whether you're building army or workers. So how do you choose what to build? In this game, we're gonna look at how the aggression shapes the larva income of the two players. I've noticed this a lot in my Zerg games. If I'm against a player who's better than me, their build usually tries to <clears throat> secure a larva advantage for themselves and they get ahead and they can make more of whatever unit they have. So let's see here, because <clears throat> we both open with Tatch Gas Pool. <clears throat> Third base coming up here for both of us. Look at how early this is. <clears throat> 230. 230 to 240, we both take a third base. This is pretty standard. This isn't like super greedy from us. The third hatch is really important for powering up. It increases your production in a huge way, especially if you can land and inject on it real fast. So we're looking at this, this is injected, this is injected. When you have around six to 10 workers at the natural is a good time to make some units. If you just want a, a general time when a lot of action happens, around this point, people tend to make some Ling Bane just to be active on the map and also to defend this third base. Pretty solid. If you want a specific example, you could make 16 Lings and four Banes and then go back to droning if you want one of those simple answer to a complex question kind of things. So queen in the main. Now these two queens are gonna go inject. So let's do a check here. Oh no, she died. So that was a nice pickup from the opponent which impacted my income. And, sorry, my larva income, not my mineral income. But we're even right now on production. The opponent has two bases injected and one base not injected. I have the same setup, but I'm also making a queen. Also a queen. Queen counts as production too. Oh, I'm making two queens. Ooh, two queens. So I am producing more stuff. More stuff, there's more stuff coming off the infrastructure. Spine to anchor this base. And now, lo and behold, I have a larva advantage. Look at this, a larva advantage and more queens. There's a bunch of Ling Bane stuff happening. I think some people overfocus on the Ling Bane a little bit. They overfocus a little bit on the micro and then their injects totally fall off and their production just falls by the wayside. So keep those bases injected. A good routine would be once you inject all your bases, Spend your larva and then look at what your army is doing. And then you can do some stuff with your army. But check out this fight here. I'm getting attacked, but what do I have? I have four queens. I have three bases that are injected. My production is looking good. My infrastructure is lit up. Look at this. The little eggs on the hatches. The opponent also is kind of injecting their bases. Nice. That's good. But I also made some queens, so I got some additional value for my hatches with the queen production. So I defended this attack. Defend, defend, defend. Make an extra queens is fine. Just be sure to use them. I do see some people who make a bunch of queens and then they kind of forget about them. That's not really the best. If you wanna just 
have a simple rule you can follow. Just keep your queens at your newest base. The newest base is usually the most important because it has the most resource. These bases have a finite amount of resource, so you want to make sure that your most fresh base is the best protected. It's also generally the most exposed by the way the maps are laid out. So be wary. Be wary. This one has some nice rocks defending it, though. So these bases are all injected. The fourth base is coming up. And then every time, every time Zerg has a base and it's about to finish, one of the best and most powerful moves you can possibly make is to throw an inject on it right when it finishes. Because that takes you from, say, three bases injected to four bases injected. Boom. Right when it was done. I challenge you to try that. Try to do that. Try to hit your base with an inject right when it finishes. You'll be able to make tons of stuff. Just tons and tons. Let's look at the production tab. I'm making more roaches than my opponent right now. Oh, now it's about the same, but also two queens. Production tab. Roaches and queens and an upgrade. Really cool. And this space was defended, and it's still injected. And this is injected. This one's not, but it's making a queen. And this one's injected. I want to say something about stacking injections, because sometimes people are like, oh, well, shouldn't you just have perfect injects? If you look even at the GSL tier, they will sometimes stack injects, and the benefit of that is it gives you more time to focus on the fight and on squeezing more value from your offensive units or being able to defend harassment and stuff. So you basically give yourself a wider time window before you need to go back and re-inject your bases. So by putting a couple extra ones on a base, it's not really a mistake. It does free you up. But you do want to make sure you remember to inject that base once the cute injects are finished. So this match kind of plays out. I feel like we got most of the the production essentials here of getting that larva lead and continuing to produce, continuing to inject, continuing to spend. When players get max, they usually try to trade and then remax. And I think we're even on larva now but we're both making pretty larva efficient units and for zerg as you're getting into the late game injecting becomes less important than it was in the early game because your units are more larva efficient so if they're making hydras and lurkers they're not as dependent on injections as they would be if they were making ling bane roach lings and banes and roaches are all more larva hungry for their cost so cool we got a little bit of Zerg. Some Zerg focus knowledge there. Cool. Any bad habits to avoid? Talking both in general and for Zerg. I think most players over focus on their army at like a low a low to mid level they'll just watch their army for the whole fight and they have a really simple army that doesn't really require much micro like mass roaches so for most most zerg players the thing you need to do for your engagements is you have all your stuff kind of in one clump usually just split it and then go in and you'll naturally get a much better arc whenever you connect with the enemy's army if you split your army before you go in. Having a good formation is going to be more important than your on-the-fly micro. If you have a good composition and a good formation, your attack angle should be pretty good, and then you don't have to do tons of really fancy micro. Is proxy hatch a legit strategy for ZVP? Yes, it is. Yes, it is. Oh, there's a questions document. Wow. Was this made by Pact Facts? What a blessing. Thank you, Pact Facts. Cool.
cool. So we already got the first one, second one, third one. Sweet. What do I build drones? Scout timing for Zerg. What do I do against three base Protoss as Terran? Well, you want to be active with your units and take your own third base. That's a very kind of general situation where both people have stuff going on. And the way that you get ahead, I think, depends a lot on what your plan is for the matchup. Like, what is your plan max out? How do you plan to harass and deal damage? How do you plan to defend their attacks? And what areas of the map are you trying to control? Is leaving a lurker or two at my expansions to fend off drops a good strat? Yeah, I think one to two is pretty much fine for doing zealot run by. There's a little bit of a, a decision there because lurkers are part of your army supply, whereas you could do mass spine, which doesn't influence your army supply. So if you do that, you are weakening the overall strength of your main army. But it does defend the bases pretty well. You want to make sure there's detection though too, because lurkers need detection to kill DTs. How do I defend against multiple drops as Zerg? It's hard to divide my army group. Yeah, so usually you have your army group, which is on one hotkey. And then you could have maybe 14 lings or so, just patrolling back and forth in your main base to defend. It's pretty good. Or you can have, say, five roaches and two hydras. <clears throat> Against Protoss, the example is having four hydras in the main, or whatever area is the most droppable, to deal with the warp prism. A general rule on when to transition to hive in a standard ZVT and ZVP. Yes, that's whenever your fourth base gas comes online. When to get static defense as Zerg, you want to get spores against Protoss at around 3.30 to 4 minutes. And against Terran, you can drop your spores at 4.30. Spines, it's kind of situational and preference based. You could put one spine per base whenever you saturate it if you're kind of at a low level and you just want it to be pretty clean. Do you use camera angle commands on all your expansions and your main? I use camera location hotkeys, if that's what you're asking. You don't see these classes in Twitch collections or on YouTube? There is a playlist for the classes. Maybe someone can link that. It's on my YouTube channel. Any tips on self-destructive mindsets while losing? Yes, the most important tip that I want to give people is you should go into the match with respect for your opponent. It is a very powerful edge to have because a lot of people, I talked about this on the Pylon show some, a lot of people think of themselves as very smart. And if their opponent beats them, that means the opponent is more smart. So they're kind of always hanging in the balance of trying to be validated by the outcome of a ladder match, which is just putting way too much on the line. A StarCraft ladder game is a game. It's fun, you get to interact, you get to practice and compete, and you get to learn, which is wonderful. Your opponent is a human being, they have a rating that is probably close to you if you got matched against them, so you should respect the danger they present to attack in your base. So if you respect the opponent, at the end of the game, if you lost, you'll say like, hmm, I need to figure out this, this master plan that they used against me and what I should have done better, as opposed to someone like Idra, who would lose and just say, oh yeah, it's just bad, or it was just stupid, or he's an idiot. And he would just kind of ad hominem attack the opponent which I think frustrates yourself more because it's more upsetting to lose to someone who's stupid than it is to lose to someone who's smart. And StarCraft is a hard game, so if they've gotten up to your level, they're dangerous, at least in some ways. In ZVZ, is it ever wise to build the creep all the way to the opponent's creep? I mean, the creep should expand. 
Your zerg, we swarm. The creep advances. It is a tide that moves toward the opponent. Is there an upper limit on the number of queens you want to build? That depends on the situation, but having seven against Terran and Protoss is a good number, where you have three that are injecting and four that defend and spread creep. How much of an impact does splitting three workers at the very beginning make? Almost none. It's not going to impact your win rate at all. Do you think there's something that is unbalanced in StarCraft 2? I think StarCraft 2 is in a really good spot. In Legacy of the Void Beta, it was pretty awkward and imbalanced, and they've done a good job of balancing the game more and more. They did some big design changes, and every time there's a big design change, the game is going to be pretty imbalanced, but that's inevitable. In the current meta, it seems like the game is quite fair, and when I watch pro games and when I play games, I feel like the person who performed better won. I don't really feel like, oh, well, this person was just playing the, the favored race. Whether it's favored or not is very little impact compared to who plays better. So just play better. Also, if you want to zoom out a little bit, balance can kind of ebb and flow, where maybe, say, ZVP, for example, it favors Zerg by 2%, and then it favors Toss by 2%, and it kind of goes back and forth. You can get a really big edge for yourself if instead of focusing on if your race is maybe a little bit less favored and you, you whine on the forums and stuff versus you're just constantly practicing and improving and working on your fundamentals like scouting, like production, and your skill level is on the rise, the players who are complaining are going to fall behind because they're not focusing on their improvement. So focus on your improvement. The game is quite fair. You haven't played StarCraft multiplayer in a couple years. Text guides with basic builds. No, that's kind of on the to-do list, I guess. I do have a, a Zerg build class. Is it better to split before attacking, or is it dependent on the circumstances? Well, for Zerg, usually you want to a little bit, but yeah, it is dependent. If you ask a broad enough question, usually the answer would be, it depends, blah, blah, blah. Okay, we already answered the queen question. Overlord speed is a very good upgrade, it, especially if you're playing a, a macro-oriented style where you're trying to get a big economy in three to four bases. If you're being really aggressive early, usually you don't want it. How possible the opponent's tech impact the development of your own eco? You want Ling Speed to help with Hellions, so you mine some gas. Yeah, but you're also enhancing the the strength of your Lings by a massive margin. Slow Lings are really bad, but Speed Lings are the fastest unit in the game. So I think having those trade-offs where you impact your income a little bit to be more successful in the fighting force of your army is really important because fighting against a StarCraft opponent is not like you're trying to top a DPS meter on a boss that's just not moving and you just get to stand there and like do a rotation. It's something that involves you attacking and retreating, moving around. You have to do a bunch of different stuff. So it's not just about how can I maximize my income, period. You could try to make a strategy like that, but... Yeah, you're going to have to invest in some defense and some tech as well. Spores against Zerg, any rule of thumb? Um, if you're against Mutas, usually it's better to make Queens than it is to make Spores, but having one Spore per base and one Spore in the transfer areas between your bases is pretty good. Any way to safely skip the Bane portion of ZVZ into Roaches? Yes, I have a build for that on my YouTube. What do you think of balancing the game by letting AI like Alpha Zero play Protoss versus Terran? Play perfect matches with different tactic. It's going to be a while until we get the, the AI kicking people's butts. We'll see how that goes. I'm interested. As a Protoss, is it safe to take the third around five to six minutes? Oh, yeah, there are definitely some times where you should not expand. Like, if the opponent is doing a one base all-in, 
and you're trying to take a third, you're going to have a bad time, of course. Yeah, a lot of the benchmarks for when you take your third base are kind of assuming that the opponent has saturation going, rather than they're just building up to go for a huge attack. When should you start Overlord speed? <clears throat> I have a ZBT command. I learned a style from Lambo, and I take my Overlord speed right after Ling speed. How to deal with mass carriers when having mostly low-cost units? You can base race when they move out, but that sounds like a situation where you're just really behind and Protoss got to a, a strong point. You can go for 2-2 two, two Queen Hydro timings if you identify carriers fast enough. Carriers take a long time to build, so if you're suddenly surprised by 8 carriers, I think that is a scouting problem. What race do you hate to play against? None of them. I think StarCraft is really fun for all three matchups. For Zerg. <clears throat> How do you decide when to build a Roach Warren? Usually when you pass around 11 workers at your natural. How to break a 2 base Protoss that is walled off? Why would you break a 2 base Protoss that is walled off? 2 bases is pretty straightforward to defend. You can Bane bust them sometimes, but why not just saturate your third? Because you can counter a hyper defensive play by being greedy. In a standard macro opening, what are the supply timings for overlords? 13, 19, 31, 40, 45, 49. In PvZ, is it safe to assume you should not take a third next if the Zerg is still on two hatch? Mmm, sure, yeah. You can go for Charge Lot Archon Prism in that situation, maybe with Storm. When I play Hydra and Protoss gets High Templar, should I make Lurkers before Broodlords? It, that depends on your preference. Because the amount of lurkers you make will delay your broodlord timing, right? But it can make you a little bit safer leading up to that. No, I, I believe that AI can work in StarCraft. It's just one of those things that I haven't followed it, so I can't really say where it is now or this and that. Yes, this class will be on YouTube. Hello, YouTube. What would be a reasonable army transition when you went Roach, Ravager, Hydra? Ravagers and Hydras being together in a composition, I think, is one of the examples of anti-synergy. Because Ravagers and Hydras have around the same range, and they have the same job, and they fill the same role, and they tend to get in each other's way. So I prefer either choosing Roach Ravager or Roach Hydra. You can transition from Roach Ravager into Roach Hydra, but usually you want to phase out some of your Ravagers. Appreciate the subs and stuff. I'll give some shout outs here in a minute. If you don't have a specific idea in mind of what Chrono Boost should be spent on, the Nexus for probes, if you don't know, and you're not trying to hit a clear timing, or just your forge for upgrades or something. You found the games more mentally taxing as you've improved. You've avoided pushing into Masters because of this. Use it as an excuse to off race and not playing. As far as mindset goes, what kept you pushing as you improved? Well, I like the challenge of facing opponents who tax me. Like, that's part of what StarCraft is, if you think about it. Like, you're specifically entering into a scenario where your opponent's job is to tax you and to destroy everything that you've built, to raise your last structure to the ground. So conceptually speaking, that is the nature of business here. 
So to move up, you have to tax yourself further by challenging opponents who are a little bit better than you. What kept me pushing in that direction? I think of it as kind of like a training in warriorship, right? Where it is an opportunity to see what you can do as a person on a frontier of competition. You could think of the same thing for, say, chess or poker or boxing or some other sport or whatever. But StarCraft is a really cool frontier where you can have an individual quest to be the best player you can be for the time that you're willing to commit to it. When to decide to go for single evo chamber versus double? It kind of depends on what you're against and what your style is. I think in most cases you're not going to be really punished one way or the other. But just so you know, I think the important thing to point out here is that if you go double evo, it doesn't really hit its power spike until you have 2-2. Two, two. And then 3-3, three, three, obviously, it's going to be really great. But the upgrades that you have are going to be a stronger edge the greater your supply. So if you're going for double evo, your early attacks aren't going to be super strong because your opponent could have more army. It's going to look the best at 2-2. Two, two. As Terran in late game against an enemy air army, now that Ravens have their anti-armor nerfed, how should I get AoE? Thors. Thors are incredibly strong. As a Zerg player, they are ridiculously scary. Once Terran gets like 10 plus 3-3 three, three Thors, they can kill almost anything. What is your best advice for someone as Zerg trying to go from gold to plat? Make more drones. I mean, the, the whole premise of this class, I think, being able to produce more, is what is going to take most people from Bronze to Masters. Bronze to Masters is usually just decided because one person is doing stuff and building up and the other person falls behind. Overlord Scout timings. 4 minutes, 5 minutes, 8 minutes, and 10 minutes. With Hydraling Bane against Storms... How do I play around the storms? Well, we talked about this during the class. The Ling Bane should be hitting the probes and the Hydra should be defending on creep. If you're attacking into storms, that is not the way that you use Hydra Bane. And then you're going to be transitioning into Broodlords. You have problems defending Archon drops. You have 10 roaches and you have queens to so snipe the warp prism. You train, trade ineffectively and have to pull drones. Help? A lot of that depends on your execution, how many drones you have with it as well. I don't think you really need 10 roaches. You could probably do it with 5 roaches and 5 queens. It's mainly about the queens pressuring the prism. They nerf the hit points of the prism by quite a bit, so it's very fragile. Archons are super sturdy. You go queen with minor zergling support when you play zerg. Do you reckon the number of hatches per workers is the same as the class notes? Yeah, about the same. I mean, you could maybe have a little bit less injects if you're making more queens. Assuming evil production, what's the best PVZ defense versus a 3 base Roach Hydra timing attack? Well, Immortals just mow down Roach Hydra really fast. Charge Lot Archon is also very well rounded. So, you don't really go into a match with like no sense of what army you're going to build and you're looking at your opponent because sometimes this is a big problem when you're moving up the leagues sometimes your opponent is going for something that's kind of bad and doesn't really make sense so if you're trying to counter that you're just going to be confused and that's where the point we made about composition and making your own well-rounded composition comes into play you should just keep to your plan they're going roach hydra you should have a good army by the time they get there in TVP, what should you build or start for that gets nice ego that can rival Protoss and standard play? I think making two Cyclones early keeps the Protoss honest. They can't be too greedy. You can even be active with them and sometimes hit an attack with like two to four Cyclones. Cyclones are really good kind of general purpose early game units. Do you know how to take more gases as Zerg? Yep. 
Take the gases when you've saturated the minerals at a base. Is there a good resource demonstrating ling bane splitting in micro? How would I practice it? Hmm. I think Pig has a guide on ling bane control. I'm not sure. I mean, if you're watching a stream, you can kind of pay attention to what it looks like when they're controlling it. When should you drop your first creep tumor instead of injecting? That depends on your build. Usually you inject both bases first and then you spread creep and make another queen. How can we improve micro? I practice my mouse control using aimbooster.com's challenge mode. I'm new to StarCraft four to five days. Do you recommend 1v1 unrank or custom against AI to improve my macro gameplay? and learn their counter units. I think learning counter units is way less important than the essence of what we've covered today, which is production. Customs and unranked and stuff versus the AI are probably gonna be lower stress and would be a good space to kind of build up your basics to the point where you're ready to fight against some human players. I have a build order class that you can go over if you're looking to learn Zerg. Do swarm hosts have a use in ZVP? Yeah, we saw Rogue use swarm host against Deer last night. It didn't end up working out, but I think the idea of it was pretty good. Any builds worth learning a Zerg? Well, it depends on if you want a macro or cheese. 13 gas, 12 pool, Ling Bane is really good cheese. Hatch gas pool is the most standard Zerg build, which is 13 overlord, 17 hatch, 18 gas, 17 pool, Ling speed, two queens. How do you approach deep staggered tank lines with Roach Hydra Viper? Well, there's a point where if your army is too weak to fight it, then you can just run around and cut off the reinforcement line. The way that you phrase the question indicates that they have the stronger army than you by a big margin, which tells me that you probably fell behind in gas. And it takes a long time to establish that tank stagger. So having your Roach Hydra a little bit more forward on the map means that it's more difficult for them to establish a good sieging position. They have to siege to shoot you and then gradually move forward. As opposed to if you're just sitting at home, then they can drive up by your fourth base and then get a super great pre-split. Do you have a good video versus Ghost Rush? Ghosts are really bad against Roaches. So I scout with Overlord speed at like 3.30 to 4 minutes, and if I see the Ghost Academy, I get maybe 35 drones-ish, and then I make Roachling. Ghosts don't come with Cloak anymore. You can make a Spore if you want to, but it's usually not necessary. You can just go Lair. Creep Tumor first in ZVT. Well, if you rush the third base or if you're making two more Queens, you can if you want to. In Plat Diamond MMR, do you think going double forge for upgrades in all matchups is okay? Yeah, you can. You can if you want to, but the same principle applies of you're not really going to hit a power spike until you have something like 2-2 and a 200 supply army. So if you like playing a, a long patient game, then sure. Using fungal so bio, to stop bio so banes can hit, do you think it will work? Oh yeah, infestors are great. The rain or the area of fungal is much larger than it was before. How do you control the banes in the mid game fight versus Protoss? You kind of a move them. I put them into the probe line. Is it best to learn one build and practice it, even if it isn't necessarily best for all matchups before adding more? Yeah, I would say so. You could kind of use a musician example, right, where which would be more beneficial for learning how the music works? Picking one piece and refining it to the point where it sounds good, or having like eight different sheets of music and just playing each of them once? To quote Bruce Lee, he said, I fear not the man who has practiced 10,000 kicks one time. I fear the man who's practiced one kick 10,000 times. Or maybe it was just a thousand, something like that. Should there be more than one Spire created? 
I think if you're on a huge map like Darkness Sanctuary, you could make it work. Would you saturate the 4th and 5th base mineral lines before taking gas? Well, those bases happen so late that your main is basically mined out, so... You always want to have 3 base mineral saturation, maybe 3.5. When to transition from mid-game to late-game production? When the 4th base of gas kicks in. What's the best way to use infestors? Behind the army line, so because they're very fragile and they don't have an auto attack. Keeping them on a separate hotkey is good too. How do you deal with constant medivac drops? I have overlords near all the dead space areas and cliffs near my base. I have some lings in my main, and my queens focus the medivac. I like plus one melee in ZVP. It's fun. Did you veto any of the maps? Yeah, just the old ones so that I could practice on the new ones. Nice. Yep, this will be.